Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gabriel Golanda. I'm an enrolled member of the Round Valley Indian Tribes of North California. <laughs> Descending from two bands of our now confederation of tribes, the Nomlaki and Concow bands or tribes. I was born and raised uh, a thousand miles from home, if you would, that being uh, the Round Valley Indian Reservation or the Covalo Indian community. I was born and raised in Port Angeles, Washington. And my theme is kinship. And I'll tell you how I knew I belonged. That's because my grandma, who was sent to a boarding school from Round Valley in the 19 teens, that being the Riverside Boarding School, which is several hundred miles in the opposite direction to the south. She was five or six. Her and her brother were sent on a train to Riverside. Over the course of her life, she ends up in the North Olympic Peninsula. I won't bore you with that story. Um, but the reason I knew I belonged is because even though she was displaced from her mother and her homelands and ended up in a place uh, called Squim Dungeon S. Washington, she told me I belonged. And she put me on her knee, and in a smoky, gravelly voice, she rocked me on her knee, and she would repeat to me, you're no Mlaki and Concow. You're no Mlaki and Concow. You're no Mlaki and Concow. She didn't say you're Round Valley. She said you're no Mlaki and Concow. And that's how I knew I belonged. And very simply, I would submit to every indigenous person in the room, that's how you know you belong. It's because your mom told you you belong. Perhaps your first memory, I would suggest, is probably of some notion of your belonging. Your dad perhaps told you that you belonged. Your grandpa and grandma or grandpas and grandmas told you belong. Some relative told you belonged. And it's very simply that relationship and that kinship between you and your parents and your grandparents and your aunties and your uncles and your cousins. And of course, we call people cousins that aren't even strictly speaking cousins, right? We call people aunties and uncles that aren't strictly speaking aunties and uncles, at least in the predominant society's view. That is kinship and that is belonging. And it is that very simple notion of relationship, and I really appreciated the chairman's uh, words this morning about relationship rights. That is a relationship right by birth. That is a birthright to belong, to share that kinship. And we don't need to think more complicated than that. It is a, a right that was guaranteed to you upon your birth to your parents unto this land. And I really appreciated that concept of relationship right in the treaty realm as applying equally to this notion of, of belonging or what we now call membership or we now call citizenship. And to be clear, tribes before John Marshall and before John Collier and before anyone else named John were kinship organizations. We were not necessarily nations or governments, at least in our own minds. Legally speaking, that was devised by people like the Johns. We were relatives, we were societies, we were clans, we were moieties, we were communities, we were families, we were kin. This idea of membership introduced us in 1934 as a fiction foisted upon us by the United States government, along with blood quantum. Citizenship is something that suits us today for a lot of purposes, because it fits within the nationhood paradigm. And candidly, the nationhood paradigm is, is I believe, how uh, tribal governments will sustain themselves in this broader rubric of federal tribal relationships. But again, even nationhood or citizenship, at least to my thinking or understanding, is not how we identified ourselves. Again, it was as family. And it was through belonging. And the United Nations Declaration was cited earlier, and Article 9 of that provision says that indigenous peoples and individuals have the right to belong. Not the right to be a citizen, not the right to membership, the right to belong to an indigenous community or nation, not strictly talking about nations, but communities or nations, in accordance with the tradition and customs of the community or nation concerned. The tradition and custom being that very intimate relationship with one another. The tradition and custom not being some notion or fiction of blood, as our good relative explained to us. Not being because someone's name was put on a piece of paper and because you then descend from that person who, whose name was affixed to that piece of paper by some non-Indian agent centuries ago. 
but in accordance with the traditions and customs of the community or nation concerned. And I tell you my story about kinship and, and candidly a void of understanding who I am and where I come from because of that boarding school legacy. I should tell you when I was a teenager I got a certificate from my tribe that said I belonged. It said I was enrolled to the Cobalo Indian community, which Congress then changed to the Round Valley Indian tribes. Which sort of confused me as a teenager. And it said my grandma received an allotment, RV918, and since I directly descend from her, my great grandma I should say, that I belonged. And I've now learned that that allotment was a piece of land that was part of a concentration camp that the Nomlaki and Konkow tribes were marched into in a trail of tears that ran over a mountain pass from essentially the Chico area into the Covalo area or Round Valley, a trail upon which women and children died and were eaten by hogs when the cavalry left them for dead. So I have this piece of paper issued by a tribal government referencing a federal land record from the 1800s that corresponds to my great grandma's belonging, I suppose, that ultimately corresponds to genocide in a concentration camp that is now the home of my people. And again, my grandma is who told me I belong by telling me I was not Nomlaki and Kong Kao. So these are not simple notions to us in these days and ages. I understand this history by my grandma and great grandma, but I also understand this very horrible history by of my tribe and my people and bands that have now been assimilated or confederate, confederated into a tribe that isn't even indigenous people. There were no Round Valley Indians until Congress uh, named as such or until we started identifying as Round Valley. We were Yuki, we were Pomo, we were Nomlaki, we were Konkow, but today we're, we're Round Valley. And so it's a, it's a confused thing to be a, a native in this day and age when in many respects our identities are formed by modes introduced by the federal government to exterminate us. By allotments like RV 918, by blood quantum, like residential requirement, like base rolls, like censuses, <laughs> like Dawes rolls, as I'll explain. And I'm really grateful to be here because I'm, I'm advised, as, as I still learn who I am and who we are, I'm advised by people like Vine Deloria and people like Hank Adams and people like David Wilkins and Shelley Wilkins. And it's amazing when you read these words and you put them in the context of kinship, exactly what they say. But the totality of this wisdom is that we are not identified by allotment records. We are not identified by some artifice that is blood. We are not identified even by, by roles, or at least we shouldn't be. We need to more basically focus on who we are as, as Indian relatives and that fundamental right understood internationally as the right to belong. I want to tell you the story that I, uh, I've received permission to tell from 86 relatives who descend from a treaty chief that signed the Treaty of Kalapuya in the 1800s. These relatives are currently enrolled with the Confederation of Grand Ronde Indians in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. Very recently they were disenrolled and then re-enrolled. And with their permission, I just want to tell you the story to illustrate this point I'm making about the need to restore kinship as the fundamental way we identify as belonging or identify others as belonging, rather than these federal constructs. Their story begins with uh, Tahanna Tamil, who in 1855 signed the Willamette Valley Treaty, also known as the Treaty with the Kalapuya. He was the first chief of the Wallala Band of Tumwaters the Upper Chinook people known then as the Cascade Indians. That treaty, which bears his X, of course not his signature, but his X, was ultimately a treaty that laid, led to an executive order that established the Grand Ronde Indian Reservation. Tumulf never made it to Grand Ronde because not long after he signed the treaty, Lieutenant Phil Sheridan of the United States military, uh, an Indian fighter to be sure, hung Tummel, and his people then, without their leader, uh, basically fled from there. Tummel had a wife named, named Susan. The spelling of her name, at least according to an 1860 or 1872 census, depending on uh, the version of history that the United States told, again, these censuses don't tell a particularly accurate story, uh, Susan Tumult, or Tumultia, as her name was spelled on that census, 
ended up living in a city of, of Oregon, Oregon City, but found herself on this role that corresponded to the Indians that made it to Grand Ronde. They ultimately had a daughter named Kaliah, also known as Mary, also known as Mary Wolwiety, also known as Mary Stuquin, also known as Indian Mary, a, a famed figure in Oregon Indian history. She was born to Susan and Tumult in October 1854, described as a strong, independent woman who, when a little girl, suffered the hanging of her father and eight of his colleagues, other Cascade Indian leaders, by the United States. She endured considerable racism and hardship and resisted the movement of the tribes, multiple tribes, to places like Grand Ronde so that she could remain in her traditional homeland by, cast, by the Cascade Rapids in the Western Columbia River Gorge. Her father had just been hung, her mother ended up in Oregon City, and she stayed home. She never reported to Grand Ronde. That's actually a story a lot like the Lummi Indian Reservation, as I, as I understand it. There were a lot of tribes and bands from the North Sound who were supposed to come to Lummi and refused to leave their homelands, whether it was Fidalgo Island, Northern Washington, Southern British Columbia. There's a legacy of Native Americans refusing to go to these concentration camps or to these reservations. Kalaya ultimately married a Wishram man named Henry Wolwiety. And that is the last name used on her tombstone and some legal documents, which I'll come back to in a minute. After her husband's death in the 1870s, meaning her first husband, she married Johnny Stuquin, a Cascade man and traded horses for a 168-acre parcel of land just downriver from Beacon Rock. Her brother built a cabin where her daughters Amanda Stuquin Williams and Abby Weiser Easterbrook were born and raised. She died in 1906. She is buried with her mother and her two sons, who died in childhood, I'll come back to that, and most of her family in the Cascade Cemetery near North Bonneville. The cemetery, which includes a mass grave of Cascade people relocated from the main cemetery on Bradford Island during the construction of the Bonneville Dam, was called the Cascade Pioneer Cemetery. Generally speaking, to be Grand Ron before a lot of constitutional changes, you needed to descend from somebody whose name appeared on a roll or record of the United States. My clients, in the face of disenrollment, said, we descend very clearly from Tumult. His name, or at least his ex, appears on a roll or record of the United States. That's the Treaty of the Calipulia. That document established ultimately the Grand Ronde Indian Reservation. This is the seminal document of what it means to be Grand Ronde in this day and age. But as it turned out, this document was not good enough for the powers that be. So then they said, but we have this census, and we can establish that Susan was one of Tumult's wives. And her last name is spelled Tumulcha, T-O-M-O-L-C-H. Tumult is spelled Tumult, T-U-M-U-L-T-H. But linguists will look at the Anglo or European misspellings of names like Tumult and come up with 16 variations of the word Tumult. Tumult, T-O-M-U-L-G-H. Tumulch, T-O-M-U-L-C-H. Tumulcha, T-O-U-M-O-L-C-H-A. Susan Tumulcha appears on a record of the United States of Grand Ronde Indians. It says it's an 1872 census. Some dispute that. It could be an 1860 census, again, exclaiming the lack of reliability of a document like this. But the fact remains, this is a Grand Ronde census prepared by the United States, and it includes Susan's name. We have the treaty chief's signature, and we have Susan's name on the roll. We have a role and a record prepared by the United States to prove that we belong. As it turned out, that wasn't good enough. I'll come back to those relatives in a minute. But as Grand Ronde history evolves through allotment, which is what censuses were, like these were used for, which is basically to break up the familial connection between person and land, break up the kinship connection between that person and the land, these roles were basically used to create allotments that were uh, devised to make land divisible to individual Indians so that the communal land base could be destroyed and we would evaporate as Indian peoples. And as we all know, until 1934, they did a pretty good job of that. Millions upon millions of acres were lost 
and many, many, many Indians in generations found themselves assimilated through the allotment, through the assimilation, and through the boarding schools of that era. And Grand Ronde was no exception. In the 1930s, the Grand Ronde Indian tribes adopted the Indian Reorganization Act. And I want to read to you uh, what our good friend Hank Adams re writes about the Indian Re Reorganization Act. The writing of constitutions after the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 created some of the problems of arbitrariness, arbitrariness and senseless requirements, particularly relating to place of birth and residency at the time of birth. What the Indian Reorganization Act did, as our friend has explained, and as the professor from the college has explained, it introduced a bunch of notions upon us about what it means federally, meaning in the minds of the federal Indian agents or John Collier, to belong. Residents in the reservation or in the concentration camp, as opposed to those who had been displaced by allotment or other forces. Blood quantum, some degree, perhaps one quarter of Indian blood, which our friend has explained is a complete fiction. Uh, it introduced the notion of, of membership, disenrollment, tying back to these Dawes roles or these base roles that were introduced in the late 1800s to basically assimilate us and to divide up our land and take it from us. As Hank testified to Congress, essentially what we are indicating is a person does not leave his tribe just by physical mobility. The fact is there are only a few methods of separation from one tribe and from the federal trust, 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 trust responsibility and that is by expatriation of some form or another. The Indian Reorganization Act constitutions were rarely motivated by the judgments of an Indian tribe and what's best for themselves. They pretty much sold us on this. What Hank was basically explaining is this idea that an Indian is no longer an Indian because they're displaced from their land was a fiction introduced upon us by the United States government. The idea that Kalaya was no longer an Indian because she stayed where she belonged and didn't report to Grand Ron is a fiction that the United States has uh, foisted upon us and it's one that we have unfortunately uh, adopted as our own. By the 1950s at Grand Ron, assimilation had taken hold, allotment had taken hold, reorganization had taken, home, taken hold, and that tribe ultimately found itself terminated. Sadly, at least from what I understand, there was not a Lucy Covington, who we all know from Colville as the savior of that tribe in the face of termination in the 1950s, at Grand Ron. And you can look at these headlines that almost suggest that the Grand Ron Indians wanted to be terminated. Here's a, here's a headline from the Oregonian. Oregon Indians express views on impending emancipation. This is how tribal members were talking about it. And they show a classroom of Indians and the title is Integrated. Another headline, Oregonian, February 1952. Indian, singular, to end after 100 years. At Grand Ronde, the Indians work at a variety of jobs, mostly logging and farming. In Southwest Oregon, they work as longshoremen, loggers, farmers, and guides. Their integration is so complete that Indian culture has all but disappeared. A few elderly women and men at Grand Ronde are expert basket weavers. One family has maintained an interest in tribal dances. Otherwise, their ancient culture has all but vanished. Even some of the old timers at Grand Ronde are of mixed blood. Some are descendants of soldiers stationed as guards at the reservations in the early days. At any rate, it is impossible to identify many of the Coast Indians by appearance. These notions of blood quantum, this racialized fiction of identity had taken hold. The assimilation of the Grand Ronde Indians or the Cascade Indians or other Indians that reported to Grand Ronde had taken hold through industry like logging. And again, in the 1950s, there was no force to prevent the termination of the Grand Ronde tribes. And so they were terminated. And then 30 years later, they were restored. And we heard about the situations with the California Rancherias and other tribes, including tribes in this area, that have been restored after termination or restored after never being recognized. And what you do in that instance is you bring everybody home. Because without bringing everybody home, you don't have the critical mass of community members that you need to show the United States that you belong as a tribe. 
So in 1986, the descendants of Chief Tumult and Susan and Kaliah returned home. And the enrollment committee, by this letter, January 10th, 1986, at 2 p.m., examined the enrollment applications of the then Williams family. Quote, the documentation that was submitted by the Williams family proved they would have been eligible for enrollment prior to termination. This documentation included a copy of the treaty made with the Kalapuyas in 1855 that the Williams ancestors signed. The letter concludes, the enrollment committee unanimously voted that they be recommended for enrollment. And as you might expect, descending from that treaty chief who was hung after he signed the treaty that established that reservation, they were enrolled. And so were their coming generations. But later that decade, after the tribe was restored, after they brought everybody home because they needed to to establish their, their recognition, they formed a casino on Spirit Mountain. Fast forward, that casino became the most profitable casino in Oregon. And all the members of the tribe began receiving per capita payments from the revenues generated by that casino. Well, by 1999, just 15 years after they had been recognized, after 30 years prior to that when they had been terminated and generations lost in that termination, they began to change their constitution to essentially prevent the next generation of Grand Rons to be enrolled. <coughs> Dismemberment is an accurate depiction or picture your family tree and you just cut off one of the major limbs to your tree. As of 1999, the youngest generations of that tribe were no longer, no longer eligible for enrollment. But matters got worse. In 2013, the powers that be undertook an enrollment audit. And my advice to anyone in the room is if you ever heard the word enrollment audit, you better start paying attention. Because that is code for terminating your relatives. That is code for disenrolling your kin. It's not about correcting errors or disproving uh, fraud or proving fraud. Enrollment audit means you have trouble. Well, in 2013, this enrollment audit was undertaken, and the auditor looked at the records. This non-Indian accountant in New Mexico looked at the records and determined that a treaty was not a record of Grand Ronde Indians, and that the determination made by the same people that restored the tribe, those same elders who restored the tribe in 1983, when they made that unanimous determination in 1986, meaning almost 30 years prior, they were in error. The accountant said they were in error. And that's all that the politicians need to begin to disenroll the descendants of Tummel, the descendants of, of Susan, the descendants of Kaliah. My clients then had to <coughs> prove that they belonged. And I would submit to you, other than the certificate of enrollment I have, this is my great grandma was a fixed RV 916, I couldn't come up with another piece of paper that said I belonged. I would submit to you that most Native Americans I know probably don't have a piece of paper such as the one my folks were asked to find, which is find the proof that Susan gave birth to Mary in the 1850s. Find it. If you find that proof, you belong. Well, you know what? Indians weren't citizens until 1924. Women. Indian women or otherwise uh, couldn't vote until 1920. We all know the atrocities of Native America in the 1850s, uh, Indian wars among them. So the notion that they could find the birth certificate tying Susan to Kalaya was preposterous and is preposterous. My folks finding levity in the situation called it the magic unicorn that they were on a hunt to find. So they went to Provo looking for the magic unicorn. They went to Washington, D.C. to look for the magic unicorn. They went to Sandpoint Archives in Seattle, Washington to look for the magic unicorn. They didn't find the magic unicorn. But they knew that they belonged. They knew that the chief belonged, Susan belonged, and Kalia belonged. And they also knew that not far from the area that I described where Kalia led her life, was a cemetery, the Cascade Pioneer Cemetery. And they knew that Indian Mary, who's a folk hero status in Oregon, 
Her grave is there, and it's this beautiful monument that you would expect almost royalty to be uh, adorned with upon their death. And it says, Mary Lawiety. Again, remember um, that she had a married name. In loving memory of our mother, Mary Lawiety, October 1854 to December 21, 1906, age 52. Youngest daughter of Chief Tumulg. Again, the misspelling, T-O-M-L-A-L-G-H, of the Cascade Indian tribes and his wife, Susan. They also know that right next to Kaliah or Mary's gravestone is just a stump. Nothing elaborate, but just a, a stump suggesting it's a headstone. And so they went to that grave as they had before. They never particularly paid attention to the details they now had to pay attention to. And they learned that that stump was, in fact, Susan's grave. Again, it's just a stump. There's not a monument. There's no etching. But when they researched in the Cascade Pioneer Cemetery, they found documents describing Susan as Mary's mother. And they found a record that says, see three by five card for more info on two boys also. And then they found that three by five card. You know, just imagine this Rolodex of cards corresponding to a bunch of gravestones in a cemetery in Skamania County, managed by non-Indians since the, I don't know, 19th century. And here's what that 3 by 5 card reads. Mary Wawiety's mother. Grave also contains two small sons of Mary Wawiety. I mean, this is Susan's grave. Also contains the sons of Mary. According to Indian custom, when small sons passed away, Mary had her mother's grave open and placed the babies within. Mary's mother is buried next to Mary's grave. No dates or other information available at this time. Forgive me if I get choked up. That's kinship. They opened up grandma's grave to put Mary's sons in the earth with her. They didn't keep a record of Mary's birth or probably her death. But they kept a pretty beautiful record in this 3 by 5 card and the related documentation that correspond to the graves of these relatives to make pretty clear that Tumult was married to Susan. And Susan and Tumult gave birth to Mary. And Mary had two sons who predeceased her, probably in some form of disease. And those sons were buried with Grandma. The magic unicorn, right? All this evidence was produced to the Grand Ronde Indian tribes. And it still wasn't good enough. I submit to you that if we are going to go according to these notions of roles or records or even treaties or quantum, that none of us belong. None of us are Indian. And if the gun is ever pointed to your head like it's been pointed to the descendants of Chief Tumult, you will not be able to prove your belonging which is why we need to change the conversation. Thankfully, a court of appeals at Grand Ron, as David and Shelley were our witness, ultimately found, in the matter of equity, it was too late for these relatives to be disenrolled. They are enrolled in the 1980s. It's been 30 years. You've held out this legacy of Tumult to access the Columbia River Gorge for sovereignty rights and for fishing rights. You cannot now claim that they don't belong. If you're going to claim that they don't belong, you're going to go back in time and claim that no Indian at Grand Ron belongs potentially, and we're not going to let you do that. So the Court of Appeals at Grand Ron never determined as a matter of law that what I'm telling you is the truth or became law. They simply said you waited too long in deciding that they don't belong. And thankfully, those descendants of Tumult and Susan and Kalaya were re-enrolled and uh, find themselves in good standing with the Grand Ronde Indian tribes. I'll conclude soon, but another passage that Hank offered us, testifying to Congress in the 1970s. We're indicating there should be some period of realignment for membership before anything gets, sol gets solidly on who constitute members of our tribes. And somewhere in these, this, and I can't find it right now, he talks about how the federal government and tribal agencies 
have both committed grave mistake as it relates to, to roles. And it's, it's understandable when you understand that roles and records and treaties and allotments were all designed to exterminate us. So if you put those tools in the hands of anybody, including tribal governments, they're going to be hard pressed not to make mistakes, perhaps hard pressed not to commit some form of injustice. We have to move away from those federal notions of genocide and assimilation and termination as the, in terms of how we identify each other as belonging. And I would submit to you that unless we get back to the ways that became so plainly obvious in this conversation about the cemetery and these gravestones and this burial rite, that our entire future is, is in jeopardy. And I want to conclude with a quote that Vine Deloria included in his books from Chief Seattle. And I've interlineated the word our, as in we. This is Chief self-talking self to the non-Indians at the time. And then when I read this quote, I want you to ask yourselves, are we the we, or we become the them, as it relates to who we are and how we belong? Have we become the you? The very dust upon which you now stand responds more lovingly to our footsteps than to yours, because it is rich with the blood of our ancestors, and our bare feet are conscious of the sympathetic touch. Thank you very much.